I intend to start off by talking about the Harvard, uh, a few of my experiences that you won't have heard of before regarding probably the Roaring Forties um, for 15, 20 minutes or so and then if we've got time and you want to carry on, we'll talk about the Brightening Fighters for about the same amount of time. And I think the Brightening Fighters, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to get out to you because we did a hell of a lot of work over in England for five years. We, we toured 13 countries and we did hundreds of hundreds of shows and displayed to millions of people. But it was never reported back here, even though it was huge in England. So uh, if I get some time, I'll give you some Brightening Fighters stuff. I think you'll find it very interesting. Um, as far as the Harvards go, I was able to look out there now and four of those Harvards that landed, I, I flew in July 1966 on my wings course. Uh, I started my wings course in, in January, February 66, and we started flying in July. And I've just checked my logbook, which I have here, um, to prevent any arguments. Uh, we started flying, my first flight, uh, I'll come back to that. But in July and August, I flew 98, 78, and another one out there as well. I was 66, which is now in, in, in Tauranga. And over my career within Warbirds, I owned two half shears in an airplane in Harvards. One was 57, which we built from scratch, from playground, which is out there today. And I bought a share in Harvard 65, which is also out there today. The other important one that I flew in, in, in July, the, in fact, 8th of August, um, was Harvard 99, which I owned outright for up to 10 years. Beautiful aeroplane. The two most important aeroplanes uh, starting off in my Harvard career was the very, very first Harvard I ever flew in the Air Force on the 11th of July. 1966, and I didn't even know this until I checked my logbook, was Harvard 92. So war was the first airplane I ever flew. Uh, and a few weeks later I went solo in Harvard 83, and Harvard 83 now is part of the uh, backup for the Harvard historic flight, it, the uh, Air Force historic flight at Ahaki. And I was sent solo by a guy called Peter Adamson, he was a brilliant instructor, and a few of you here will know him. Uh, and I was very, very lucky to have him as my instructor. And also to follow me through in the Air Force. I, uh, when I was on Bristol Freighters, the Monty Bristol, he was OC of uh, Three Squadron Tactic. And then when I, just before I left the Air Force, I was OC uh, One Squadron, the Andover Squadron. And he was my uh, transport flight commander, or transport commander in those, OC Transport Wing. So he looked after me right the way through my Air Force career and he finally went on to be Chief of Air Staff and we still keep in touch. And I had great delight in ringing him um, four or five years ago and said, you know what happened today, Peter? We, you, you sent me solo in Harvard 83. So he was, uh, he was quite moved to hear that. So I flew to Harvard quite a lot in the Air Force, of course, PDS, and I went back as an instructor, learning to fly to be an instructor uh, at CFS. I was just having a talk to Barry Mitchell here today. He was one of he appeared in my logbook teaching me how to be an instructor. And then on to PDS, where we had Harvards of course, and then I went to instructor on 14 Squadron, and we had a couple of Harvards here as uh, as FAC aircraft. So I had quite a long involvement with the Harvard and the Air Force. Then I left the Air Force and uh, joined Air New Zealand and went sailing. And not only certain habits or any any airplanes outside work, but Trevor Bland set up Warbirds, of course, with Harvard 92. So I joined as an inaugural member. And a few months later, they sold the Harvards, or some Harvards are being sold again. And John Lamont grabbed me in the crew room at Wellington and said, "You've got to buy a share in a Harvard." And I said, "I'm not interested." And he said, "You've got to buy a share in a Harvard, otherwise it'll go to uh, Australia." I said, how much? And uh, he said, 1,200 bucks. So I bought a, a one-tenth share in 65 for 1,200 bucks. And I had been sharing that airplane for over 20 years. Uh, wonderful fun. So I didn't do much flying then because I was really involved in yachting. And then one day I got a call from Bruce Donnelly, who some of you may remember. And he said, we, we're going to expand the Harvard team, the aerobatic team. 
could you uh, mind coming along and, and joining us? I said, well, that sounds pretty good fun. So I came out here to Ardmore and Ross Ewing gave me a half an hour check out in the Harvard. I hadn't found one for seven or eight years. And then I got in with Bruce and with two Harvards and we did some formation loops for 45 minutes to an hour. Now, I'd never done formation loops officially before. Um, there's a myth going around. I was never ever in the red checkers. Uh, I was a truckie, and truckies weren't allowed in the red checkers. You had to be a nut or a helicopter pilot or someone important. So I was never allowed in the red checkers. However, I made up for it by um, getting into the Harvard team here. And at the start, the Harvard team was uh, Ross Ewing and John Denton, John Lamont, Bruce Donnelly, and myself. And we had a wonderful um, year, a couple of years, flying around the countryside doing air shows and so on and so forth. And then we, we realised we hadn't got a name, so we needed a name rather than the Harvard Formation Team. So we were sitting in the bar over there, the old, old war birds hanger, the old, one of the old half round hangers over there one night. And there's an old boy called Charlie Liddell, who some of you may remember. He uh, had an Avro 504 here in bits and pieces. And he said, I reckon you guys could short, should call yourselves the Roaring Forties. Because you're all around about 40, the aeroplane's around about 40. And, and it's an appropriate name. So that was around about 1983-84 that we became the Roaring Forties. Shortly after that, we ran into a bit of strife because it was costing us a lot of money to go to all these air shows. Uh, I was a co-pilot on the French in those days on about 12 grand a year. And it was costing us about $1,000 each every air show we went to. By the time we paid our share of hireage of the airplane, the fuel, accommodation, transit and so on. And the air show was giving us nothing back. So we pulled out. We said, we've had enough now. Unless you start paying for us, we're not going to do any more. Well, that didn't go down well at all with anybody. And we received an awful lot of bad press. Who are these arrogant sods wanting money to fly airplanes? Um, but it just, got, it just got financially ruinous. So for two years, we, we didn't do any displays. And it was Tim Wallace who invited us in 1989 back down to Wanaka for the very first Warbirds ever, Wanaka, or Warbirds on Parade it was called. And he paid us a few bucks. And that's where it started. You cannot run these aeroplanes um, for free. So we now, I, I presume the Roaring Forties are still getting some sort of money to help out, which is which is really really needed. A couple of highlights um, from the Roaring Forties. I well, I spent eight years in the Forties. I led it for three, and and I'll see if I here for seven years as well. Uh, highlights. Uh, the first one was really. If you weren't Air Force, you couldn't be in the team. Ex Air Force trained, you couldn't be in the team. And I decided we had some pretty good pilots here, some pretty good GA pilots. So we selected um, three GA pilots, Robbie Booth, John Greenstreet and Steve Taylor. And we worked them up into the team. And uh, they, were, they were wonderful. And, and the team then became a civilian team, basically, with, with those guys flying. And they never let us down. They were wonderful. Sadly, John was killed here at practice one day, um, and that's another story. Another highlight was we took the team to Australia in 1991 for the 70th anniversary of the RAAF, and that was really, really enlightening. We got to Australia, and we were borrowing their aircraft, and their CASA, their Civil Aviation Authority, would not allow them to fly dual or carry passengers in the aeroplanes or do any aerobatics in the harbour, which to us was patently ridiculous. So we worked on them over there. We had a couple of weeks working up and so on. Got the aeroplanes up to our standard, how we, how we liked them and so on. And by the time we did our display in, in Richmond, we were carrying people in the back of the aeroplanes. We were doing aerobatics. And we did a complete show over the Sydney Harbour by the bridge with passengers on board. So the Australians had changed their mind. Uh, that was probably one of the highlights. Another highlight was I went to a place called Kenosha. Being CFI leader, in the, leader of the Roaring Forties, I went to Kenosha for the NATA, 
Now the NATA is the North American Trainer Association, and they're a big organisation, a bit like Warbirds, but they just deal solely in the Harvard and the T28. And Kenosha, just south of Oshkosh, that was a workup for the um, for the Oshkosh arrival. And I was lucky enough to meet a lot of these guys and fly in their formation, and one of them we flew in was 75 aircraft, 75 Harvards. So that was quite an experience. I had a very interesting experience here one night. A chap came up to me and he said, are you a New Zealander? And I said, yes. And he said, are you, are you in the New Zealand Air Force? And I said, I used to be. And he said, the New Zealand Air Force wrecked my aeroplane. <coughs> and I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, I designed the Harvard. Now, my God, I wish I knew his name. Um, he gave me his card, long lost. He said, the Air Force, the New Zealand Air Force, detuned the ailerons in the Harvard. The Harvard was designed, but technically, with a throw of 45 degrees up and 45 degrees down, and also a servo tag, which made the ailerons more effective. So the harbour then had a wonderful rate of roll. <coughs> Excuse me. Our Air Force at the time decided that the young fellows flying these things would twist the wings by using too much aileron. So they detuned the wing from 45 degrees to 30 degrees. And, he's, and he quite rightly said it wrecked my aeroplane. Now if you'd fly in the harbour, you'd never know. Um, and all our Harvards out here have got 30 degrees, so they've been wrecked. And unless you've been in a Harvard with the full throw, or get out of a nicely harmonised aeroplane like the B-40 or the Spitfire, back into the Harvard, it becomes a drain, very sadly. And so sorry to any Harvard owners or pilots here at the moment. When I got 99, I bought the mod to, to retune it back to original specifications and it absolutely transformed the aeroplane. <clears throat> and it was always used, <clears throat> excuse me, in the number five position of the Harvard team because it was so bloody good with ailerons for rolls and flick manoeuvres and so on. And I couldn't get the likes of Gavin to Billy or John Peterson out of it. Um, it transformed the aeroplane. And when I sold it, an Australian guy came over here, Steve Teeth, who was the uh, leader of the Warbirds over there, and he said, oh yeah, man, I've heard all about that, these bloody ailerons, you know, no change. He got out of the aeroplane and he was absolutely flabbergasted how, how good it was. Now, I've told every single pilot here, or owner of the Harvards, change them. Sadly, no change. Um, to their loss, really. Uh, another interesting thing you might be interested in, I'm not allowed to tell you about, but, so don't pass it outside this room, please. We'll put it on the blog. Um, Robbie Booth flew with us. You might have heard of Robbie. He was a very, very well-known racing car driver and a bloody good pilot, but he only had one leg. Um, but he flew the Harvard and the Sea Fury really, really well, and the Venom, I think, as well. It didn't affect him at all. And one day we were doing a show over Wellington for the local car races in those days, the street races, and it was Nasty Wellington day, 35, 40 knots, which is as bad as it gets in terms of turbulence. And we started off with what they call a VEC loop, the same as the, the 40s are doing now with a five ship formation. And we dived down over the harbour, and Lamont was leading, and then Robbie was beside him, number three, and I'm number five, doing the solos on the outside. And we pulled up into the sloop, and we got a hell of a bang of turbulence. We really did. There's harbards all over the sky. And we recovered and came out the bottom. And it was a bit of mumbling, and John said, I think we'll call it off. So we called it off. We went back and landed at Wellington in 40 knots in a harbour, which was no one, it was a, quite a feat. And Robbie came wobbling over to me with his one leg, and he showed me his helmet, and he said, look at this. And I said, goodness gracious, there's a huge gouge in, the, in, the, um, in his helmet. I said, how on earth did that happen? And he said, well, because I can't use my knee like you can, I loosen my lap strap and I use my whole hip to use the motor. So I've got a very loose lap strap. And when we hit that big bump, he said, I crashed into the roof and it took this huge ding in my helmet. And I said, goodness me, we well, did a good job. And he said, no, that wasn't the worst part. He said, the worst part was my leg fell off. <laughs> <laughs> so there he is flying around the leg, one hand flying and one hand trying to put his leg back on again. But I'm not allowed to tell that story. Um, those were the good times in the Roaring Forties. Uh, we had a few bad times, um, and 
one I won't go into at the moment because we're running out of time. Um, so what else have we got to say about that? Roaring 40s. That's about it really. Um, not much else to talk about. I think that's enough for the Harvards. Um, I've had a wonderful life on them and they're a beautiful aeroplane and they're as good today as they were when they come out of the Air Force, I'm sure. So have we got enough time to talk about Brightening Fighters, Dave? Okay. And in 1994, I was, uh, I've been flying Tim Scores here and the Royal 40s and, and, you know, CFI here and got to know Ray and Mark Hanna very well and Stephen Gray for the fighter collection. And I was doing a lot of work in England at the time, I was on the 747, backwards and forwards. And I was over there on holiday one day and they called me up and said, we're very short of a pilot this weekend, would you mind coming and helping us out? And I said, no problem at all. And I ended, it was the 50th anniversary of D-Day. So we took 12 fighters from Duxford down to Falaise in France, down to the D-Day beaches. And I got thrown in Stephen Gray's Corsair and went down with Ray and two Corsairs. And uh, it was really uh, chucked in at the deep end. Um, and I survived apparently, so I got invited back regularly. In fact, I've been invited back every year now for the last 25 years. And last year was the first year I've gone over there and flown. So because by then I was really reasonably well known, I got a phone call from Ray one night, and he said, we're setting up a team called the Brightling Fighters, sponsored by Brightling Watch Company. Would you like to come over and join us? You'll have to come over for five months. And I said, I'd love to, what do I get? And he said, well, you get a watch and probably a a typewriting and a sea ferry. And I said, that'll be worth it. Colin Glasgow was a OC Ops or Ops Control, but no, I've forgotten the name right now, a Flood Ops Manager for New Zealand. And he was my immediate well, big boss. And I had to get him to approve the leave without pay for five months. And Colin used to own a hangar over here. And him and I and Keith Trillo had a share. We owned that little fucker triplane for a long time. So he gave me a contract I couldn't refuse, which was, we won't touch you for six months, and you can come back in one day. So hey, that was a pretty good contract, I thought. And off I went in 1999, and we had five, five months flying around, in, uh, around Europe and England. And the team consisted then of four different aeroplanes, uh, Ray Hanna in the P-40, me behind him, number four in the Corsair, and we had a guy called Andy Jet flying a Spitfire and Mark Hanna in the, in the, the 109. And it was very hard to get a team sorted out with the aeroplanes with completely different power settings and, and, and requirements. But we did, we, we had a, a, a good display worked out. And in fact, we won that year at Biggin Hill, we won the trophy for the best display. We beat the Red Arrows. So that was a, a feather in our cap. Sadly, at the end of uh, 99, Mark was killed in Sabadell. Um, very, very sad, but that's another story. And uh, we thought it would be all over. So, but Brightling said, no, we want you to continue for the next few years. Are you interested? And we said, yeah, sure. So, we then set up a new team for the 2000 year. Um, Ray in the P40, me in the Corsair and a chap called Nigel Lamb, uh, flying number three in the Mustang. Now, Nigel was eight times English aerobatic champion and also owned the Rothmans aerobatic team. And then we had Lee Proudfoot in the number two slot, flying the, the Spitfire. And and I'd, I'd rate Lee as the, one of the best World War II pilots, or, Warbird pilots ever flown with. So we had a bloody brilliant team. And I was the bunny. Those guys all had display authorities down to zero feet. And I was 30 feet. So I held them back. But we seldom went below 30 feet anyway. But they never let me forget it. And, and our stupid rules here of 100 feet just drive me around the bend. And I occasionally forget that and go a bit lower. Um, so we set up this new team with those four people. We had an eight minute display because we had a lot of experience in the team and eight minutes is the best display time. Any shorter, it's a bit too short. Any longer, you get a bit bored. People start buying ice creams. So that was our team. And we, 20% of our work was going to air shows and doing displays. And we did hundreds of them all around Europe, say 13 countries. 
and 80 percent of it was PR. We, were, we weren't there to be looked at, we were there to sell watches. So I'll just give you three quick examples of what we would do, apart from just going to an ordinary airflow. Um, one example is the very first thing we did was in 1999, the World Watch Conference, or what do they call it, um, show in Basel in Switzerland, they had huge watch sales. And that's where they sell the watches for the year. I learned a hell of a lot about watches, believe me, <clears throat> over five years. And that's where they sell all their watches. They've got this huge convention centre and everybody has their own um, display. You know, Casio, Rolex, Breitling, and away they go. And they've all got their own stand. Now, it's not a stand like they used to show. The Breitling stand was four storeys high within this complex. And at the top of the Brightening stand there was a full-size gripping hanging from the roof. And it was invitation only. So that's the sort of thing we're at. Now, we took five fighters over there to Brazil, <coughs> landed them and lined them up in a, um, a line. And they were, we, the colour scheme of Brightening is yellow. If you buy a yellow, if you buy a Brightening, you get a yellow box. So the, paint, the noses were all painted yellow and we had um, the Brightening Fighters badge on the side of the aeroplane. So there was nothing apart from the camouflage, apart from the yellow on the nose and the badge. Lined them all up on the tarmac, and then they put artificial grass around them, put a huge marquee over the top, and down the other end, they had a dance floor and, and, and table set up for dinner. And during the watch show, Brightening got their 80 top salespeople from throughout the world put them on two buses in the evening, brought them out to Brightling, and it had all been secret up until then. There was no such thing as a Brightling fighter, so it was absolutely top secret. These people got off the bus, walked into the marquee, mood lighting, the yellow noses, and we're all standing there in our bloody Azuma seats looking pretty. And they were introduced, uh, Teddy Schneider, who owns Brightling, introduced, ladies and gentlemen, the Brightling fighters. So these people all came through and looked at the airplanes and spoke to us. We had five pilots there, and we had two patrons worth mentioning. One was a guy called Jacques Remlinger, who was a free French pilot in Battle of Britain during World War II. Amazing, amazing guy. Um, and the first guy back to land in Europe after, after D-Day. There's a plaque on the beach at D-Day. The other chap was a guy called Don Strait, who flew during World War II, and his claim to fame for the modelers. He flew a, a Mustang called Jersey Jerk. And his claim to fame was he shot down two, two six twos in one day. Went on to be a general in the Air Force. And if you look at Grant Wilson's stairman here, you'll see on the side that it's dedicated to, to Don, Don Strait. Amazing man. They were our patrons. So in come these 80 people from all around the world. Look at the airplanes. Go and sit down, have a lovely slap up meal. It's a bit of dancing with, them, with a World War II World Meet Again type band. And 90 minutes later, they left. So all of that effort for 90 minutes, next day it was all turned down and we went home. So they, it was purely promotional. The sort of thing we would do to promote um, Brightling at shows, I'll just give you two examples. The first one was the Paris Air Show. We did three Paris Air Shows. We never flew as a team there. Um, we had all the airplanes lined up again with their yellow noses. And, and Ray Hanna couldn't stand the French and da da da, so I ended up flying there all the time. We just did solos. Horrible place to fly Le Bourget because there's nowhere to go. If the engine stops, it's completely built up. So Muggins was given the job for that. But the place to be at Le Bourget was the Brightling Chalet. And it was a huge chalet, probably half the size of this hangar, on top of the roof of a hangar. Grass, palm trees, stunning. Um, lovely looking hostesses and all that sort of carry on and VIPs were all invited from around Europe to that particular um, chalet and truly that was the place to be. But during the day what they did was they looked at the fighters down below, the five fighters or four fighters parked down below. They would take four at a time and take them down to the end of the, into the aerodrome, put them in the Brightling Fighters MD Notar helicopter take them all around Paris, down the Seine, around the Eiffel Tower, to a place called Pontoise, which is an aerodrome just to north of Paris, <coughs> where uh, 
like Ryanair and those sort of airlines go into, a uh, little regional aerodrome. And there, we had another little marquee set up with uh, two stewards, and we'd, we'd land these people there, four, by, four people, ladies and females, big and small, young and old. And then we'd get another drink and a, and a canapé or something. And then we had two Mustangs there, put them in uh, the back seat of the Mustangs, and go and give them 20 minutes formation. And then come back and land, get rid of those, take the next two, and by then there's more helicopter guys coming through. We did that all day. So it was really purely promotional flying for, for um, brightening people, brightening salespeople and, and agents and so on. And once a year, Brightling would hire a whole aerodrome in Switzerland. And for three years, we hired a place called Buox, which is a big uh, ex Swiss Air Force base, um, two big long runways where they used to have their, their mirages. And it's where the Pilatas are made, Pilatus Porters are made in the hills beside the aerodrome there. Um, and Mount Pilatus is right there. Now they'd hire that aerodrome for two weeks and they would get once again their, their top salesmen and their agents from all around the world in one bus load of 40 people. And that 40 people on the first day would go to the Gretchen um, factory where they made the, the Brightlings, the, the watches, and they would be shown around the, the, the Brightling factory for the day. And there was a uh, spit fry on the roof of that place, believe it or not. And then the next day they'd bring them out to Buox. And at Buox, there would be 16 aeroplanes, all part of the Brightling setup. The, the four Brightling fighters, the, the Brightling jet team, uh, six of those, six uh, L-39s. The Brightling Eagles, which are an Italian mob, they were the hardest case you ever came across, and they were in Super 32s. Broke every rule of the book, you think we're bad, those guys were phenomenal. And we had a helicopter with a Brightling thing on the side of it, and a Pilatus Porter for parachute propping, completely red with brightening on the side of it. And two aerobatic people, one called Xavier de Laperon, who was world champion, and he was the most amazing pilot. He was in a Sukhoi 28, and 80% of his show was below the stall. He'd get airborne and just stop and wave around and do a few turns and a few flicks. And to watch him was, it's just incredible. So if you ever want to, um, Google Javier Lapron, he was phenomenal. And his girlfriend was Brigitte de La Salle, and she was European champion. And, and the plan was, these people would arrive, and they would all do a show. We'd do an eight minute show in the valley, and then the Jets would do theirs, and then do a parachute drop, then Xavier, and then, you know. So it was a 45 minute, one hour, flying display, purely with brightening. And then another cup of coffee and a few um, beers or whatever they had, and then they all had the chance of doing two things. They could fly with the Brightling fighters, with the jet team, go for a ride in the helicopter at the top of Mount Pilatus, or do a parachute drop. So they had all these options, these people. So wonderful, wonderful promotion. Now we didn't take them for we didn't take them for a ride in the Brightling fighters. We took we had either two Mustangs there, two Harvards, and quite often we had um, two two seed hooker hunters. So for these Kids from all around the world getting rides in his aeroplane was something else. So that's just a very, very, very brief touch on what we did with the Brightling Fighters for five years. It was a hugely wonderful experience. It was boys' own stuff for me. Four pilots charging all around Europe with four aeroplanes. And we always flew the same aeroplane in the team, but when we transited somewhere, we swapped aeroplanes. And there's always an argument that night, the night before, who was going to fly what? You're too old, you've learnt last week, you're a cripple and that's going to carry on. So I ended up getting more flying than the rest of the aeroplanes in the course here. Um, so that's a very, very brief outline on the Brightling fighters. And I'll just finish up saying that it all started with a Harvard. <laughs>